So, well, first of all, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, converse with me on uh, on a recording. Of course, man. It's it's always good to talk to you, and I'm sure there's going to be some gems that we can share with uh, the folks watching. I, I hope so. And so to, to give a little backstory, uh, I had asked you a question about galleries out in uh, LA, and you were like, I don't know. I'm having my own issues with that. And then I was like, oh, yeah. I would like to talk to you about this. And then I was like, oh, I would like to record this conversation. Oh, let's have a podcast. So this is, uh, so this, is this experiment, which I, I, I know you are similar in my way of like, let's try new things and let's put them yeah, in the world absolutely. and let's see what happens. Um, yes, definitely. So I appreciate it. Uh, and uh, I won't do like a little bio thing. People can always look that up if they don't know you already, but, but sure. I'll, I'll include something wherever I post this as well, but people can look up on your website. Uh, mm -hmm. But we know each other for now for many years. Gosh. It's, it's yeah, it's got to be going on eight. Yeah. Going since, on eight years. Mass 365. Yeah. yeah, that was uh, 2010, 2011. It kind of branched into both of those years, so. And then that was uh, shortly after that project ended. It was when you came out to Richmond for the Skull -A Day show. Yeah, is that correct? I think that was yeah, that it was the right right, right around that time. Yeah, twenty eleven, I think. Uh, yeah, and then we got to meet, which was cool. Uh, yes. Right afterwards. So, yeah, for me, this conversation is sort of like artists talking to artists about the art biz, the art experience, mm -hmm. the art making process. Um, I think I get asked a lot of questions, I'm sure you do too, and sometimes they're always the same and you're wondering why people want to know that, but then there's stuff that I want to know that I realize like only other artists sort of seem to have some insight on. Um, yes. So did, first of all, I know you went to the uh, Corcoran School of the Arts, right? That's correct, yes. And you got a yeah. BFA. That's right, that's right. So what was your um, area of focus? I focused mostly on painting, actually. Um, when I went in, I had more of a focus on what at the time they were calling computer graphics. Now it's digital art or, or, or design. Um, but I wasn't drawn to their program in particular. I had a really good teacher in high school, and I kind of didn't feel that they could really push that that knowledge base. So I focused more on, on painting. Um, and then after college, I kind of let go of painting. I mean, I was still doing it a little bit on the side, but Corcoran was a difficult experience for me. Um, I'm sure there's things I learned, but I'm not sure those were the things that they were trying to teach me. <laughs> I'm sure there's um, things I learned. It's a, it's a good autobiography. Yeah. It's, um, I, well, I mean, to your, to your credit too, Noah, like uh, if there were, two teachers that I've had that have had the most impact, it would be you and, and my high school teacher, uh, Miss Flo. Wow. I mean, thank you. So, uh, well, I look, it's, it's one of those things where it's a testament to the, the body of work and the knowledge that you put out there for, for other creatives. And I've, I've seen it work for a lot of people, you know, like that creative sprint is, is necessary. And I think it's something that's maybe not taught in schools. It, it it is I guess not, and I kind of part of the reason I was asking about your education. So you, and you didn't get a master's, and you never, right? You never. No, I, I didn't. That. I you know I don't say I never want to go back to school, but I don't feel like. Okay, so let me. <laughs> I'll break it down to you like this: When I was at graduation, and um, they had uh, the speaker come on, and that was the first time I ever heard about somebody getting an honorary doctorate. And I decided, well, if you're telling me that I can work and achieve a certain <laughs> amount of things, and eventually you guys are going to acknowledge that and issue me a, a doctorate or a master's, or somebody will, I'm going to go, I'm going to take that path. I'm going <laughs> to kind of do my own thing. Um, because for the amount of money that I paid for my education, I don't feel, um, I don't think it was worth it. Now, I think for some people in some schools, it's absolutely worth it. But in my experience, I think in hindsight, I would have done it a little differently. Yeah. I, so it's interesting because I got a BFA. I didn't get a master's. I, I doubt I ever would unless I similarly somebody just gave it to me, which it's, right. I love the way you talk about that because I never thought about that. Like, you know, why not? Why do the work? Somebody's just going to hand it to you, um, yeah. which is funny because I was, side note, I was teaching for a long time and, you know, you're not – well, most schools, I guess, won't let you teach full time unless you have a master's and there's programs to allow you to get that quickly. But it was interesting to be like, but if you taught 
you know, if you'd work professionally for a certain amount of time, they would consider it, but it was a huge amount of time, like 15 years or something. And I was like, you're saying that 15 years of real world experience are, are only just as valuable as like two years of college, of yeah, grad school. Like, absolutely no way that 10 years <laughs> of any school is equivalent yeah. to 15 years of real world yeah experience. i was like that's that's crazy um you know Oh, so, sorry, so I got a BFA, but, but a lot of people, I, I guess they know if I've talked, you know, given a presentation or something, but I, I got a background in theater design. And so my, I learned set costume sound design. I went to NYU and so I didn't go to art school and there were, there were, because it was a BFA, they did have some arts classes. So I did some life drawing, which I absolutely loved. I had a, you know, a teacher that taught us about, you know, their sort of art class, but we learned drafting and all these other skills. I loved the experience. I got a ton of stuff out of it. I didn't use most of it right out of school in terms of theater work, but I used the skills I learned all the time, but I'm always questioning whether I missed something by not going to art school proper because mm -hmm. now that I'm in the art world, I'm feeling like such an outsider. And so I'm also interested in sort of like other people's experience. Like, is there this magic thing that happens that if you go to art school or if you get a master's, especially, and you do the whole, you know, formal, like here's my thesis show and here's, you know, do you have this entree into the art world that's different or is that a myth? And, you know, obviously neither of us had that anyway, but, I, I think it's I think it's a myth because let me tell you I went to art school and I'm still an outsider. <laughs> I see I, I maybe have a little insight into how they work and like when I want to play ball and when I don't based on what particular like attitude or behavior I'm seeing from that insider crowd. Um but there yeah, there's there's something to it that uh, you know the masters I don't think means that much. I mean, maybe it does. And like you said, it, it might unlock certain doors like for teaching because I've, I've looked into that as well. Um, but I, I have, <laughs> I, I hesitate to say this cause I'm, I'm going to tread lightly here. Uh, a friend and collector uh, has their masters in, uh, in arts and we've actually had difficulty communicating about the work that they're they commissioned and you would kind of expect a little bit more from somebody with their masters um or at least a similar understanding of how to talk about art and so i guess what it boils down to is you know you going through and getting a master's would be totally different than somebody else going through and getting right. a master's you may be an outsider, but you also may gain that little kernel of knowledge because you're going to apply yourself differently and use that knowledge and apply it, apply that knowledge differently than somebody who is going in because that's the next step after getting your bachelor's. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's my sense. I mean, but, but at the same time, I guess, and I, and I wonder if it's imposter syndrome and that everybody just feels like outsiders all the time or whether there's, you know, there is some knowledge that we didn't get or that, that there's available, right. you know, in some way. Um, but I definitely feel that way. And I feel like you, to some degree you have, so you're, you're saying you have that feeling as well about, about your experience. Definitely. Definitely. And um, I think, it, I think there is like a tie to imposter syndrome. And I think maybe that just highlights um, whatever, inadequacies or um lack of knowledge we may we may feel um actually i had to ask uh your sister micah what a cv was because i had not put a cv together and was never taught that in an art school so like i've been doing shows i've been contacting galleries i've been doing events all over the world that's not a problem and really my CV is my blog because I just post all the events and all the work releases through there anyway. Right. But it does, it's nice to kind of collect the highlights into, into one piece so that somebody can see that. Yeah. Well, I was, I, you know, good that you're able to at least ask or be honest when you don't know something. Cause I think there is that, like, I, I should know this. So I should know there's, there's that. I think getting older, I've definitely gotten over some of the like, I'm just going to ask. I don't know what that is. If people assume, you know, yeah. and you're like, I don't know what right. that is. And yeah. you know, I'm not, I don't feel judged if I don't know at this point, but I could get right. how that could be earlier. And you know, when you're younger and it's a little like, I'm supposed to know a thing. 
Right. Well, because I think people treat you like you don't know anything when you're younger. When you yeah. are inexperienced, people are going to assume you don't know. And some of that is justified because we have the experience to know that without the experience, there's certain things that you can't know. And some of that is like, it needs to be shed because the, and I think the, the, the younger generations now have probably more control than they ever had as far as like opportunities because it's really independent and they don't have to do things like go through an institution or get a piece of paper in order to um, allow for their success. They can go on YouTube and make it happen when they're 12. Yeah. <laughs> Which, so, you know, that, I mean, that brings up a good point because one of the things I was going to ask you about is social media. Obviously, you know, we came up with blog. We came up in the blog sort of era, which was short lived, frankly. Yeah. Uh, pre sort of current social media landscape, and now we're sort of living and thriving in that. And I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. But how do you feel currently about like social media in terms of um, your sort of way that you connect with an audience, the way you sell work, the way that you sort of respond to that? Uh, mm -hmm. It's a big question, I realize, but like, no, it it. I think the answer is, is it comes in waves. It really does. Um, there are some days, some week that I feel emboldened and um, strengthened by my audience through social media and my interactions with the people there. And there are some weeks that I feel that it takes away and is a distraction from the work that I should be doing. Um, and I think, I think everyone's always trying to adjust and figure out how best to work within social media. Cause they're always changing the rules. Like yeah. even, even just the, the chronological timeline in Instagram, like figuring out the new algorithm there is, is it's a whole new game and you don't know necessarily what people are going to connect with and what they're going to see and when they're going to see it. Um, but there's, you know, with the thing with social media and ever since, you know, before Instagram, before Facebook, it was, it was always evolving. Um, you know, that blog era really was like a fast era, like you said, but it, it was a fast evolution, you know, from, um, what was it? Live journal <laughs> to, to Facebook and, you know, WordPress is, I mean, it's, how many sites are run by WordPress now is just amazing. I think it's like a, actually a, a decent percentage of, of the, the populated internet is run by WordPress or something. Um, but with that being said, the social media allows me to circumvent the gallery circuit tying back into what um, your initial question was with my connections to, to galleries and um the real trick there is like, I have no problem selling the work. Um, the work doesn't always sell through the galleries. And if that's their job, then what do I necessarily need them for? Instagram is the online gallery for viewing. Um, people want to see them in person and I make sure to go out to, you know, some type of events, whether it's a sneaker convention or uh, designer con, um, you know, and, and those become the, the more, grassroots galleries like and i and i'm kind of all right with that i think that was always my intention to bring art to people that maybe wouldn't step foot in an art gallery um but now i'm at a level and works at a level that i think the work deserves to be in an art gallery and even some of the people who have started making work derivative of mine have ended up having their work in very prestigious collections yeah um so there's really just that last check mark for me it's like a legit check it's like mm -hmm. nike gave me a display adidas gave me a display like i've worked with all of these brands cadillac versace like just a, a good gallery cosign would would make a big difference and Maybe it's just a mental thing. Maybe my audience really wouldn't care. Um, but there's something for you where you're feeling like that would yeah. validate or give you some legitimacy, even though you've got right. all this other success. Right, right. With and it's not that I haven't had 
gallery or, or work in galleries or um but it hasn't been it's usually like group shows or like a one-time thing not a continuing relationship or being represented by a gallery yeah well it's interesting because i have discovered over and over and i don't know if you've had this this experience but that every time i've gotten on the other side of something that i've wanted some experience i wanted mm-hmm. to have some level some tier right that that next thing that when i got on the other side it wasn't what i thought it was at all that everyone yeah. then perceived me differently yeah. for having been on that other side and assumed yeah. things about me, right? So everyone assumes yeah. I'm, you know, rich because I have books published. And mm-hmm. what you know about the book publishing industry is that there's no, you know, unless you're the tiny percentage who are, make a big, huge hit, it's not a big money maker. It's more a nice no. business card. Same right. thing with shows. Like I have a gallery in New York City that shows me. I have solo shows in New York City, which is crazy. Yeah. And yeah. yet... I don't show anywhere else, not even my hometown. I mean, like, you know, like it's bonkers and people are like, oh, you're represented in New York. I'm like, well, yeah, but I can't figure out how to get any, like, it's so weird. You feel like you're hitting a glass, another yeah. glass ceiling, right? Yeah. Yeah. And oh. it's so strange because I almost talk about this idea of, of having success, whether that's actually restrictive. Like, in other words, like people perceive you as too successful, then they don't give you opportunities versus not successful right. enough and they won't give you, like, what, you know, is there, do you feel like there's a sweet spot for you? I, I think there, there definitely is. Um, Cause I think I'm still working on getting my pricing to the point where it should be, where, you know, I've always heard that the standard for an artist's day rate should be a thousand dollars. Now, I may charge five thousand dollars for a mask, but that definitely took me longer than five days. <laughs> right. I like you count in materials and everything else, like I get by and you know, sometimes things work out for the better. You know, sometimes bigger jobs come in and then I'm like, man, should I have asked for more? Because I know they pay this guy such and such amount and he's not delivering what I'm delivering. So like, you know, the value, but you also know that there's a value that people are willing to pay. And then there's the perceived value. And like, you almost got to like, get the average sum of the least amount that you can take for it, what you really should get for it, the perceived value and what you think they're willing to pay. And like, I mean, that's the first time I broke it down like that. And I think I'm actually going to put that equation somewhere like in the yeah, spreadsheet and be like, there, yeah, there's definitely a lot to juggle in, in, in figuring all that out. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put though, that sort of like this little mathematical mind thing you're doing. Cause people ask about pricing a lot. And I always tell people like, they call me and say, can I commission you to do a portrait sticker portrait, you know, which is what I've been doing a lot lately. And I was like, mm-hmm. you can, but you can't afford it if you're a friend of mine, because honestly I can't afford it. And I know it's unfair and I, but I can't price it so low that it will be, you know, taking up this amount of time that, is more valuable like you know that yeah it's time to explain to people like i have to make a living or a certain percentage of my living from this work and so i can't do it for too little because i'll just spend all my time working and not getting anywhere right and if i'm right. selling in a gallery they take half which is this huge thing that people don't understand so then like right that's half and that doesn't even my half includes my materials so i'm even right. making less right. you know so i'm leaving this right. tiny exactly. amount of money for a sale for a thing that took 20, 30 hours more, you know, 40 hours. Yeah. I mean, so that's a lot. And, and it's hard because I see people selling stuff super cheap. And I'm like, I don't know how they can do that other than that they're well they, to do. I, but. I don't think they can continue to do that. <laughs> there you go. I think that's that's the the key there. Um, but I mean, yeah, you're, you're, you're definitely speaking my language here. This is all the stuff that, that I juggle with. And actually we just had a huge moving sale. Like I had um, a bunch of masks and I, I often negotiate with clients, but I very rarely will go out on a limb and be like, everything's 30 to 50% off. And when you think about it in gallery terms, if a gallery was taking 50%, they're definitely taking 50. They're not taking 30. Right. You know, like, unless, you know, some of the new galleries are trying to do cool stuff like the, the, uh, no commission that Swiss beats is doing. So, but it was also going out on a limb because other collectors may perceive that as uh, a decline in value. Right. You're undercutting your ability to sell things. Yeah. Right. But it actually, it, 
I don't think it actually had that effect. I think it had the opposite effect that maybe people don't understand that that's the the business of art. Like like you said, they don't necessarily know that a gallery is going to take 50%. So if I'm selling this at 50%, I'm basically just doing the gallery work for free myself. Like yeah. the work of sending the emails, selling it, you know, um, negotiating with the client, packing it, shipping it, all that type of stuff is the stuff that the gallery is supposedly getting their cut for. Right. But I'm kind of waving that. I still get the same amount but i gotta put in a little work which goes back to what you said because our time is our commodity yeah. um a lot of people see us as selling our creativity but it's really our time it's what we can do with our time that the normal person can't do like if you give one of us a let's say a ten thousand dollar job well what we can do with by purchasing that amount of time is way more than someone who doesn't have our experience or our creative edge that's would be way able to do yeah. even with even with ten thousand dollars like you can have a great budget but if you don't have the know-how and and the ideas then it's not as you're not bringing value to that project yeah that's a good way to put it i hadn't thought about it in those terms before i think about it like um well, two things come to mind. One, I, I talked to a guy right when I moved back to Richmond and I was starting my own business and he gave me a little, some you know, business advice and it just was really straightforward. He was just like, you've got 2,000 hours a year. Mm -hmm. That was, oh, it, wow. yeah, it was that's so, it was, that was it. It was 2,000 hours. That's working full time. And he's like, how much do you want to make divided by that? I mean, it was like, and, and keep in mind that 2,000 hours includes everything else you're going to do for work. That's like yeah. marketing. That's, that's anything, right. right? So take out half, let's say you got a thousand yeah. hours. Now you got th a how much you want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. hundred dollars an hour done. You know I mean? It's like, yeah, you could just do this simple math and figure out what your value is and what's worth your time and why you want. And so very yeah. often, like when something's like, Oh, well, if you sit on the phone for half an hour with these people, they'll do this. I'm like, I don't want to do that. That's not worth a lot of money <laughs> that I could be making doing something. Other, right. you know? So I'm very yeah. cautious yeah. about that value of my right. time that way. When yeah. I think about, about the length of, you know, that money. The other thing I think about is how, like when people hire me, right. And when they hire you, they're hiring you to do what you do. Right. And I think, especially when you're in the realm of art versus sort of, I was in the commercial art world for so long doing commission stuff and, you know, as a designer and illustrator and you, you did that work as well. It's like, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're doing what they want you to do. And often that yeah. takes you down these path of like, why am I making this? What, you know, whereas as an artist, mm -hmm. the point is you're paying me to do what I do. And that's where the value yes. is, right? To yeah. your point about yeah. the money is like, that's the Absolutely. value. So do you make a living at this point just from your making art and selling art? Yes, actually, but both Betsy and I uh, work on uh, our art full time. Um, she, I'd say she probably worked part time on helping me with my stuff and part time on her stuff. And we're working towards hopefully getting her full time on, on her stuff as well. That's amazing. But yeah, ever since, um, it's, I guess it was 2011 is when I left uh, any type of like regular day job and have been just doing it, mostly making sneaker masks every now and then, like a little design work on the side. Um, my, I'd say, hurdle that I've been trying to get over for the past few years is finding a product that I can have um, mass produced that will retain value and give people something to buy that they really want over and over again um because they want the sneaker mask not everybody can afford it and i've done things like pins lace locks um this year focuses on action figures so we're looking for that thing i have i have 180 masks that are done and every one of those could be an action figure or a pin or a t-shirt if we found that thing that everybody wants like a collection of from me um i think action figures is is going to be the way to go we got some really cool stuff coming with that well i love the products you've made i mean they're always very well made and very beautifully done and i was always impressed i love that stuff i mean i know you're a collector too i like i love objects and especially art objects and 
the yeah. affordable ones. I get it. And I mean, similarly, like my sisters pushed me a lot to be like, you know, find this other price point because selling artwork, original artwork is one tier and people do want access to you. And if you can find that one, but like you're saying, you're also doing experiment and so it doesn't always succeed. Right. So do you have right. boxes of stuff that you're just like sitting on now because you made it or. Um, there are, there are two masks now that I'm kind of like, maybe I'll go back to them one day, but it was it was like kind of more experimental. Um, there are bins of, of toy parts that were like miscast and, you know, there's, there's resin scraps that we've actually saved up, um, and started casting them into larger pieces. Like we just released, uh, these Jordan three stormtrooper heads. And they actually are filled with all these different color resins that up from us making lace locks and they have little pore spouts. So you break that off and it's this little piece of scrap plastic. Well, we weren't going to throw that out. We're like, one day we'll find a use for it. And we mix it back into a uh, new resin in this new mold and it creates crazy effects. So, so you've been really efficient then. Cause you're, you're saying like, mostly it's like leftover bits and pieces, to, but you're not like, yeah, I mean, you know, I did, I did some dumb stuff when, so my side project is League of Space Pirates, and that's my, like, fun thing that I, you know, in, in the past, before I had a child, <laughs> I poured money into it randomly, right. and now I'm like, that money's right. reserved. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, I produced a bunch of records, and now I've got boxes of records, because, you know, I don't know, in my head, I was like, everybody's going to want this, and, like, nobody wants my records, because they don't know me, and, you know, I... I, I luckily they last forever and I can sell them. You know, my goal of course is at some point there'll be a level that I hit where that stuff becomes appealing to buy like ooh, collectibles. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I definitely didn't do it in an efficient way with, with my fine art. It's different. And I definitely don't have a ton of art sitting around. I, I yeah. make stuff and show it and sell it and get it out of the space. You know, I don't, don't have too much of it just sitting around, but right. you do so, end up with inventory sometimes. Yeah. Like, well, and I get weirded out about like t-shirts. Like I don't want to make t-shirts anymore because that was a whole thing about like keeping track of numbers and, you know, running out and people wanting them. And, you know, and so they're saying like, sure you got the right size. Like everybody wants a different cut. It's yeah, t-shirt game. I mean, cause you know, when I got into this, I was working at a t-shirt shop. Like, yeah. and I, and, and really when I started the mass 365 project, it was because I was trying to push my clothing line and nobody wanted to buy t-shirts from an artist they've never heard of or seen artwork from. So I'll make art every day and that'll promote the, the clothing promote your line. t-shirts. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It didn't work out that way. Not, not, it's no. a whole nother thing. But, yeah. Isn't uh, that so crazy? But also I, I love, there was that animated story recently of, of you talking about how one of your t-shirts ended up on stage though. Yes. Yeah. With method, man, that yeah. was, I, and that, Sneaker Inc. did that animation and it, it, that blew me away because it is one of my favorite stories from, you know, just the whole Sneaker Max, Sneaker Max saga. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a trip. So what was the turning point? Because I'm interested in this idea that you make a living from being creative and doing your thing. So I like, I make a living in, through a, a wide range of things. Selling art is a tiny piece for me. I'm still mm -hmm. in the realm of like, I sell here and there. It's a little boost, but I really make money using my sort of creative skill set, teaching people, doing, you know, the lectures, the, the workshops, the, you know, that stuff. It still brings in an income and I live on that and I support my family on it, which is crazy. I mean, it's not a ton mm -hmm. of money, but it's enough, you know, and I think a pretty right. simple life. And I think that's the other thing to be clear for people is like, I don't make a ton of money. Like I make, you know, I pay my bills, I pay my mortgage, you know, we have a little mm -hmm. extra, but it's, it's sometimes not. it's easier than others, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it comes yeah. in chunks and it's, it's always hard, you know, it comes and goes. Um, now I forgot what I was going to ask you about when I was talking about that though. Um, <laughs> Well, so I guess in terms of like how you're, so I think the thing that people always talk about balance. And I think for me, balance is not like the work life balance, which a lot of people talk about. I don't really, to me, that means you're working too much generally. Mm -hmm. But I think for us, the balance is more about like making versus promoting, right? Mm -hmm. Finding mm -hmm. people to buy your work versus Absolutely. making more. And like, I get in this habit of like, it's so much easier for me to do all the social media and the sharing and the posting and writing making videos and like yeah. uh, everything but the actual work yeah <laughs> which well, i should be doing but i'm always like pushing it off i don't i think, what, what I you think for me it kind of i go in waves where like um if i'm not if i'm not feeling creative or productive in the creative making zone 
then it's a good time to be, okay, I'm going to set this aside and where can I be productive in promoting? Um, but we talk about balance and I feel like when we talk about balance, a lot of people picture like a seesaw or a teeter totter and you're balancing or, or even a scale where you're balancing two things. But when in actuality it's, it's closer to juggling because that balance is like five or six things because you do have, you know, you have, not only the family responsibilities of like taking care of the family, you got the financial responsibilities, you have the promotion, you have the, the making the work. You also have the keeping up with existing collectors, making new ones. Like it's, it's a big pie and you're going to find a new piece every time you think like, Oh, I got all five things balanced. Things are working out pretty good. And you're like, Oh, I haven't even thought about international trademarks, like just (laughs) something like absurd that, or maybe not absurd, but something that, um, you weren't expecting. Yeah. And it's, it's always going to be that. Yeah. There's a lot of factors there. That's a big can of worms to crack open. Yeah. No, it's a lot. And it's a lot to dive into, but I think this idea of like, there's no end. It's sort of just an ongoing thing that you're constantly yeah, solving it's a marathon. for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just yeah. keep, just keep running. Just keep. Exactly. Well, and, and I, okay. And if we're talking about like two sides of a coin, the other side of that would be, okay, we have a following. The younger generation knows how to better monetize that following. So what, can we do better in order to to monetize that that following like um like we're not going to be on there selling fitness tea but you know there's there's some thing that people are looking for that applying our brand of creativity to would be that like breakthrough i think for monetizing an audience and and uh like you said you said um you get a lot of work from teaching or speaking engagements and lectures and that's something that i've like dabbled in you know maybe i'll do two or three a year and that's something that i would like to do more um because i think there's something to be gained from the story the i mean it's again it goes back to the creative sprint um going back and talking to art students in in high schools and middle schools and, you know, explaining them how I got to the idea that like they're amazed with, they want to, they want to get to that point, but it's not about like, like some guys are out there making sneaker masks now. Well, that's, that's not, it's not genuine because you didn't go through that sprint, that creative push, to find something that was unique to you um you know but and and that's not just in my field like any animator has i'm sure hundreds of people that are tracing their characters every day or you know drawing an image from a music video um and that seems to be a really maybe it's always been that way but i think it's something that i see on social media a lot a lot of um young artists rely on feeding the social media beast rather than coming up with something that's uniquely them and then pulling in things that are appropriate when it's right. Like we're in the middle of the NBA finals, Kevin Durant's doing his thing with the Warriors. They're up. So I got two Kevin Durant masks releasing tomorrow. Like it, if it fits, it fits, but like, don't be like, it's Easter Sunday. I'm going to go dye an egg and draw. Like, well, I mean, and, and if you're doing, it's a double-edged sword because if you're doing a creative sprint, that, that is then what you're doing. But I think what's hard, I mean, there, there's a lot to there to what you're saying there. And I think part of it is, to be fair, like all art is based on some level of, of, of copying, translating, yes, remixing, imitation. you know, imitating. It, it, original. It, yeah. It, you know, the, 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 the great masters were all, you know, you learn by painting the paintings mm-hmm. that you person, you know, that they painted, right. you, you, you know, and so I, th- there's that part of it and, and sort of being like, that's what it is. But then the part what you're saying, which is like the genuine, what is your personal expression of 
Mm-hmm. The, the feeling I is, think, I think I know exactly the the line right there. Yeah. I think you nailed nailed it. What it is is when those old masters would study old masters and how they painted, they were studying how they painted, not trying to get the end result of the painting. Right. It wasn't about the was final about product. Yeah, yeah, and and it was studying the process. And I yeah. think the process is what it's not taught, and I think it's what. I see most young artists missing yeah. is they they haven't considered the process or I, what they're what they're doing. Yeah, I saw you doing a little bit of a live thing on maybe Instagram uh, with some people, and I could see you talking a little about this topic of like people just trying to achieve what you've achieved by copying what you did. And yeah. When yeah. I give talks, especially in college, high school settings, I always say to them like, "This path I'm on is impossible for you to follow." N- I don't even, because it's a series of random things that happened to me and I made choices and I got somewhere. Right. And like, I can look backwards and I can tell you a a very specific narrative from where I am to where I started. But if I was the up going the other way, it's just branching paths and I made choices to go on them. Mm -hmm. That, so it was more about, like you're saying, the process of the journey and and sort of like making choices along the way that take you somewhere. And so, yeah, to emulate somebody you like isn't going to get you the thing that they have nor is the thing that they have necessarily what you think it is anyway. It reminds me of, um, is it Todd Henry with the accidental creative cover mm-hmm. bands won't change the world. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good way to sum it up. And it, it always pops in my head whenever I see it, I'm like another cover band. Like, <laughs> right. Hey, you can do it really well and you can get some wedding gigs, but you know, it's not going to be, yeah. not going to be a life. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so you talked a little bit about collectors. How did you develop relationships with collectors? How do you maintain that relationship? Because that seems like that's really important to your success, right? Is that, that you found mm-hmm. people that want to buy your work. And I think that's for a lot of artists that that's the case. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You end up building relationships. And um, I think, you know, sometimes it can, from, from the outside view, it can seem a little strange because to an outsider clients are customers but to an artist when somebody's paying you to make the work that you want to make it's it's like i almost want to say it's like a familial support like it's Mm -hmm. something so close to you and and something that I think immediately makes a connection or, or can, you know, and I think there are collectors that just want the item and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'd say conduct myself the same way and let, if they want that connection, if they want a continuing, I'd even say friendship. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the collectors that have multiple pieces, you know, I've traveled to see them. I've stayed in their home. I've met their families. Um, it they become part of the story um i don't know if maybe part of that is because masks are so tied to identity and so when i'm making a custom mask for somebody their identity is kind of imbued into that mask um maybe i'm just really lucky and my collectors are people like me and and that's what brings us together um i'm I'm kind of a workaholic. I'm obsessive about this stuff. It's, it's like one of the top three most important things to me after my wife and my dogs. So if somebody's interested in the work and wants to connect with me on that level, they're going to become a friend because so much of my life is the work that if the reason we have a connection is the work that is actually a lot easier than say I went to college with somebody or I used to work with somebody or I used to live with someone. We've had completely different experiences and at this point, totally different priorities because the masks have consumed every aspect of my life. (laughs) Um, And you know, some days that feels like a complaint and some days that that's just most days that's a blessing. Yeah. So, um, but it also means that the work is still very personal. Like it's, it's already personal because I pulled some, from so many of my own influences and passions to make something that 
people used to think doesn't make sense and now it's like a thing um so sometimes i kind of yeah wish for there was a little bit of separation but uh i think it's part of what makes the work what it is and, and who i am and and the reason i have great supporters is the ones that do see that connection and appreciate it are they want to hold on to it that's awesome that's great to hear yeah. um yeah. so do you 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 touched on a little bit I, you know I, i'm definitely the skull guy still even though i don't really make skull art anymore and i'm i'm somebody who's just can't i can't sit still i have to be constantly doing something else like mm -hmm. i just did this gallery show every time i've been on a gallery show it's been a completely different body of work and my guy my the gallery guy was just like can you like be a little more consistent and i was just like ah, it's just so hard for me i just i get distracted i'm more interested in something else once i learn yeah. how to do a thing i don't want to do it anymore because i figured it out and so i'm always yeah. having to like the, push the it, challenge you know, isn't there yeah, and so you know yeah. you've been very consistent with masks uh, for a long time. You know, are you feeling that? Are you like wanting Sometimes, to switch it up? But I think the reason that I keep getting pulled back is the challenge is still there. Yeah, there's there's things that I can do, and because the sneaker world always introduces new models and new materials, it really keeps the work fresh as well. Um, but there is a part of me that wants to fight being the mask guy because. I'm far from a one trick pony and I it's it's an investment. I want to diversify my body of work so that I can get more brand work because not everybody wants uh, a sneaker mask. You know, that's like a once in a while type of thing. But if I'm doing 3D models for the brands, I can I can do anything in ZBrush. So it's about, you know, kind of introducing the audience to another thing that you can do and then hoping it takes enough legs that it keeps going and, and, and people start seeing that. And sometimes they last for a year, or two years, like the lace locks and then interest dies down. And, um, but I think with the, with 3d modeling, that's a, that's a more versatile skill set. And early enough as the technology is really getting into a more affordable and better quality curve, um, I always, I kind of learned this lesson working at the t-shirt shop when direct to garment printing came out, they had a lot of different printers and there were some that were 80 grand and some that were four grand. And at a certain level, there's not a big difference between the 80 grand and the four grand you're getting in early and you're basically paying to be one of the, one of the first to do it, but you wait a little while longer and that technology refines, becomes more affordable does better work for less money and like i think that's kind of where we are or have been hopefully going into more of it with 3d printing i'm new to it it's been around forever not forever i should say it feels like forever <laughs> i feel like i'm getting on the boat late because people have been telling me to do it for years but well i was i was impressed that you taught yourself it looked like pretty fast which is pretty cool it looked like you really just dedicated some time to like just working it out i think yeah there there was the first two weeks were like pulling my hair out or or at least a few more gray hairs um the thing about zbrush is it's kind of a confusing interface but once you know how to navigate it, it seems pretty instinct uh, or instinctual um, because it, especially with a Wacom tablet, it's, it's to me, it's like just shading a drawing, you know, darker colors for the shadows and lighter colors for the highlights, except the highlights are actually three dimensional. You know, the shadows are actually sunken in. Um, I don't know if I would have been able to do it. Like if I had tried to get into it, like say instead of Mass 365, because when I started Mass 365, my focus and confidence was in two dimensional work. And then I've spent eight years since then just focused on sculpture, um, whether that's, you know, mold making or like actually sculpting with, I would say clay, because that's what people would understand the process as, but it's usually epoxy putty. Right. Um, but So you spend a lot of time getting comfortable with 3D form. So switching to a digital version of it, it's still about your ability to think three-dimensionally. I think so. I think yeah. so. I, I um, tell people often that I 
couldn't do what I do now had I not gone through the Scala Day experience. That like basically, right. even if you look at something I make now, the fabric on the floor, there's it may not seem related, but I can show you the seeds of that throughout yes. that time, yes. right? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and um, going back to what you said about uh, the the gallerist uh, asking you for more consistent work, and I feel like I heard that in college because I was doing photography, graphic design, computer graphics, painting, right. uh, drawing. Like if it was two dimensional, I was doing it. Um, but all of those things come back around into this body of work. And you have to see that body work from a further distance. And it's a larger, more cohesive body. Like you're aging a wine right now. Like it doesn't seem cohesive to somebody who's seen this show and then the next show. But anybody who has seen the Skull Day work, like it totally makes sense. Like I can see your post in the feed and it doesn't have to be a skull. It doesn't have to be fabric. I'm like, that's a Noah piece. Yeah. So it's not as easy to digest as a cohesive piece. It doesn't make sense maybe on paper at first glance, but when you're actually digesting it, it makes sense. It's a complete, like it's a complete meal, you know? Yeah. So I think, I think it's maybe it'll just take a little bit more time. And after a few more of these wild card shows where you're just like shooting out <laughs> on different branches, they'll yeah. be like something. Oh, I get it now. I mean, and maybe it's not even something that you see, but like, there's that, there's that common thread that runs through everything. Yeah. It's, a, it's been a fun f- thing for me to, to discover and also have outsiders see, because you, it's a lot harder to see it yourself. I think when somebody else comes to you and go, Oh, mm-hmm. I see a continuity. I see consistency. And like, I'm doing some, murals right now some street art which i've always been fan of and i've never really done i've started to get a little access and it's weird to paint because i can paint i like painting people don't think of me as a painter but when you're painting a wall you can't really approach it like a canvas where you're like let me what should i do here you really have to design it and then come up and yeah and do it and so i'm learning that but i'm also like what am i going to paint because you know, now I'm working with all these other materials. And so I did one and it was great to discover that people saw it and knew it was my work, even though it was not stickers or fabric or whatever, but it was about color and about arrangement in a certain way. And it still resonated. I was really happy about yeah, that, doing some more exploration great. with that. Yeah. So it felt really good to be like, Oh, okay. I'm figuring this thing out and figuring out, you know, who I am in that space. Well, I one, maybe two more questions and we'll wrap up, but um, sure. So what's your goal? What, what do you, what do you, what do you feel like? What's, what are you, what are you trying to do? I know it's a Man, big question, but that is, and uh, I, I'm often considering it and wondering if I even know. Um, I think it, I think it's best to say that I have kind of let it go completely organically everything that I've done in the past eight years has just been like you said, like you see a decision in front of you and you make it and you follow it and you do your best work along that, that decision. Um, and there's only so much you can plan because you don't know when the next big job is. All you can do is prepare for that day. If it ever does, if that well ever does dry up and it's not a big deal because you've dug another well, you, you know, uh, or you have another source. Um, and yeah, I guess the goal is just to keep completing the puzzle and getting that balance and, and finding all the parts that, that maybe could work better and, and optimizing this artistic machine that, uh, that I've built. I like that. I mean, I think the thing is like when you're already doing what you're passionate about, what you love, right. Yeah. Then all you want to do is figure out how to keep it. And I think that's yeah. very much for me. I, when I stopped working for other people, I started my own business. The goal was always just, how do I keep doing this? Stay in business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Right? absolutely. Right. Cause it's really just like, I don't want to have to ever go back to an office if I can avoid it. Like I don't want to ever have right. to be working for somebody else other than I as definitely a wake up to some nightmares like that. Like, <laughs> Not, not even like, cause there's some things that I miss. I enjoy being part of a, a, a bigger team. Like I had, I, and I'm still really good friends with all, all the people that I worked at the print shop with. Um, so I miss that social aspect of it, I think. But what, what gives me the nightmare of 
is I've been out of the workplace for how many years and it's completely different than anything I've ever been into. Um, but I'm also kind of curious about that because part of me is like, well, if the interest in the mass ever does dry up and I was applying for salary jobs, this would be a hell of a resume. So like, I just <laughs> right, gotta be kind of confident and, uh, and, and I know if that day comes, that'll just be the next part of the journey. And, and if not, then I can't, I can't even really plan for it too much. You know, you can, you can prepare, but you can't plan because plans go to shit. And yeah. the best things that have ever happened are usually the ones that I couldn't see coming. So I just gotta like, be ready for the things I don't anticipate. And yeah, just Boy Scout motto, I guess. I was never a scout, but yeah, be prepared. <laughs> I like that. No, and I think that's the right, I think it's the right attitude. I mean, I think neither of us expected our journeys to go the way they did by any measure. But I think we yeah. both were people who, you know, I grew up knowing I was an artist, knowing I was creative. I never questioned that. Yeah. I knew I was going to make, right. make right. these, you know, do that. But how it was going to look or what form it would take, I couldn't imagine. And certainly shocked almost daily by the things I end up doing. Right. I mean, I know you've ended up working with these brands that yeah. you couldn't imagine. Uh, it, yeah. Just, just it. And, and, and people that have reached out that, I mean, like you, you brought up the, the method man thing. It's like, I grew up listening to hip hop and being told that I shouldn't listen to hip hop that I was told. And, and that was from, you know, mostly from the people I went to school with, they didn't understand it. And so they didn't think I had a place for it. But now it's Method Man and Cormega and, and and rappers that I grew up listening to and they respect and collect their work and, and talk to me. I mean, because they're, they're just people, you know, nice. but I still get a little struck because I'm like, yo, I, I just listen to you. I don't know what to, te what to say to you because <laughs> I've never conversed with you. I've only I've only heard you talk. Yeah. And but, what's funny yeah. is that people feel the same way about you, you know, and and. Yeah, I mean, Betsy gets a, we were eating at a restaurant and waitress came up, took her drink order and she's like, she brought us our drinks and was like, my manager's going to take over from here. And I'm like, oh crap, what do we do? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like I, I smell a little bit like, like weed, but this is California. It shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> the manager came up and he's like, hey, you're, you're freehand profit, right? I'm like, yeah, man. I'm like, all right, cool. I was like, now I know what this is. I was like, Betsy was funny. She's like, how'd you know it was him? And he was like, it was the shoes. I'm like, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I don't mind that level of fame. I think, you know, if, as long as you stay at the level where it's, it's you know, maybe get comped a, a, a meal every now and then or people right, are right. chill with you. you I know? can still go to Disney World without it being a, a disaster. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, that, that's, yeah, that's I, the tier you don't want to cross. You don't want to get to that level where. Well, and, and fame's a funny thing too being a mask maker i literally started making masks because i didn't want to be in the limelight i didn't want it to be about me but selling your art is just as much about selling yourself as it is about selling the work so it's it's a whole package deal and and honestly i think the thing i need to do most is is share more of myself in the process through youtube because that's what people are are watching these days so I just need to get on it and, and, and do that and let people see more of me. But the art making time when growing up, it was, that was my time. That was like, I didn't mind people looking over my shoulder, but that was when it was like two people. When you have thousands of people going, you should have done this. Have you ever thought of this? Like, yeah, man, I've been doing this for eight years. I've thought of that and I've done that. And uh, yeah, I'm doing this and you don't even know where I'm going with this one. Like, but, and of course you want to, do it as nice as possible because you appreciate their interest in the work. Um, and I think a lot of people want to be a part of the conversation, but maybe don't know what to say. And so, you know, go with generics or, or try to be clever and aren't, but so it's, it's a, it's a whole mixed bag uh, with it. And I think it, as we can kind of tell from this conversation, it all connects to itself. Yeah. Uh, definitely I, I, a web. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate the last sort of few things you said. I want, I feel like that's a good place to, to wrap it up, even though I don't, you know, the answers aren't there, but I think that idea of sort of that balance of, of being an artist as an individual creator, who's bringing your personal thing, your soul out, but then also being, because it's not about making something 
only for yourself alone, that it's something that right. you're sharing and connecting right. with other people, that you have to have this relationship and you have to find this way to sort of connect. And I'm very much in that place trying to solve that right now as well about how much of myself do I share? How much do I keep private? And, you know, that tension, you know, as you say, collectors want to have a, you know, th that you can befriend them and, and that it's about the support of each other. But, mm -hmm. you know, finding that yeah, is going to be a thing. Definitely everything in moderation, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, cool, man. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, this is a, a great conversation. I could talk for another hour easy. So. Agreed. Well, we'll just have to save that for the next episode. All right, part two. Hi, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed seeing a little something different from me. I'm trying a new thing with interviews, and if you really like it, maybe I will make more. So let me know in a comment. Uh, also, I uh, did this because of the fact that I have a Patreon page, and that's where people support and encourage me, and I end up doing experimental things because of it. So if you like this, maybe uh, drop me a little support over there on Patreon, or links over there or down below. And in the meantime, watch more of my videos, and subscribe, please, and hopefully I'll see you again on the internet soon.